Greetings, everyone. I want to welcome you here today for another daily devotion. We're going through the book of Matthew together, and today's verses are taken from Matthew 27, verses 32 through 44. Since it's kind of a lengthy passage for today, I want to encourage you to pause the video, read it, and then return back when you're ready. Needless to say, the feeling we get when we read this week's passage is a lot like eating a Sour Patch Kid or, or one of the Sour Warheads. It's very sour at first, but then gives way to a real sweetness. And it's all the more pleasant because of the initial bitterness. Reading the account of Christ's crucifixion, we experience grief while at the same time experiencing incredible joy because we know what his death accomplishes which is the fulfillment of all God's promises in Christ Jesus that are attached to those who belong to him by grace through faith. One thing that astounds me is that all these events are recorded in striking detail in Isaiah 53, which was written some 700 years before Jesus and long before crucifixion even existed. I'll be reading parts of Isaiah 53 as they apply to our text because it shows not only the divine foreknowledge of God, but also his sovereign power to bring about all that he's declared in his written word. I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago in our daily devotions, and this week I'll say it again. Over and over again, God in his word declares, it shall come to pass. Not it might, or I hope it will, but it shall come to pass, declares the Lord. And when he declares something, it will come to pass. For example, his word tells us that he, Jesus, was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like the one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him, and by his scourging we are healed." So they take Jesus out, he bears his own cross, not only as a sign of humiliation and suffering, but that he's now in submission to the authority of Rome, at least so they thought. In John 10, 17 through 18, Jesus said, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay my life down that, so that I may take it again. No one has taken it from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my father. So even though they thought they were exerting their power over Jesus, he was still in control here, even though it appeared at this point that he wasn't. Now Matthew gives us the name of man, Simon of Cyrene, whom they pressed into service to help Jesus carry his burden because he was likely exhausted at this point from the beatings and the extreme loss of blood, showing that first of all, Jesus is the son of God, He's also the son of man, truly divine, yet truly human also. So having Simon carry his cross, don't think it was an act of compassion on their part. All they were trying to do is ensure that Jesus would survive long enough to actually make it to the cross to be crucified. Isaiah again tells us, Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the chastening for our well-being fell upon him. Matthew 27, 34 records, they, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he wouldn't drink it. Now this drink would have had an anesthetizing effect. Jesus' pain to a point would have been minimized, but he refused. He was about to absorb the full wrath of God towards sin. So if he accepted the drink at this point, it would not have paid the penalty for sin in full. So he refused, though I'm sure the flesh really wanted it. Now when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they crucified the Lord in between two condemned criminals, fulfilling Isaiah 53, 12. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured himself out for death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sins of many and interceded for the transgressors. Now Isaiah again was written some 700 years before Christ was crucified. In Psalm 22, a messianic psalm was written long before that, nearly a thousand years before Christ. So the gospel writers all see that Jesus fulfilled this messianic psalm, which describes crucifixion of Christ again in striking detail 
given the fact that crucifixion wasn't even practiced at that time. Psalm 22, 16 through 18 says, For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They've pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now we started out talking about the bitter sweetness of reading this account. It's painful to look at what Christ endured on our behalf. In fact, I don't even think we can fully comprehend exactly what Christ really suffered for us. He drank the full cup of God's wrath. He was mocked by his peers. He was betrayed and abandoned by his closest friends. It's really painful to look at. But without the cross of Christ, the wrath of God would still be over our heads as we still owed a debt for sin. Now, Jesus paid the penalty for sin on our behalf. He voluntarily died a penal substitutionary death. So it's true that one hand, the cross is hard to look at, as the hymn Amazing Grace puts it, right? When I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. So yes, very hard to look at. But on the other hand, what a source of praise and glory and joy towards our Lord Jesus Christ. When we consider the cross and what he endured on it, our hearts should burst out in praise. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. My hope and prayer is that, first of all, we walk around in gratitude for Christ, the suffering servant. Second, we know that no matter what we're suffering from, be it tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, None of these things will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. For we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Will there be times when we don't praise God the way we should for the cross? Absolutely. But take some time today and reconsider just what Christ has suffered for you and be grateful that he's taken the punishment that was meant for us. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. God bless you guys today as you walk around in gratitude for what Jesus Christ has done for us. See you next time.